Hey there, Brian Goulet here of GouletPens.com shooting Goulet Q&A episode number 76. This is on May 1st of 2015. Technically, that's when this is publishing anyway. I'm actually shooting this on April 22nd, way more in advance than I would normally shoot a Q&A uh, because I am going to be out of town with my family on vacation. We're taking our kids to Disney World. We're super excited about it. Uh, and by the time this actually publishes, I will actually have already completed my trip and we'll be back home already. Um, but it's uh, just kind of a weird thing, like I, because I won't be here, I won't be able to record it as normal. So rather than cancel it or try and fill it with something else, I decided to shoot it in advance because we had a lot of really good questions. So I'm doing that well in advance so that I can um, you know, be able to wrap up all the rest of the stuff that I'm doing. Um, but anyway, I figured you know, better early than never, I guess would be the way to say it. But um, anyway, here I am. So got a lot of good questions. Um, last Last week I ended up shooting that one a little bit in advance too, but uh, this one, I, which last week's I shot actually yesterday in real time, so it's all just very confusing. But still, I thought you would appreciate just having a video one way or another, but I got a lot of good questions, and because I'm shooting this basically in the future, I don't really have any updates on anything because things haven't really happened yet as of when I'm shooting this, so um, I will just say that, um, you know, vacation was great, I had a wonderful time, and, um, you know, we've surely launched some new things, and there are definitely events that have occurred, and uh, lots of noteworthy things have happened on our social channels, so, um, you know, just, I can't be really, really specific at all, so I won't have much of an intro, so I guess we'll just go ahead and get right into the questions for this week. So, um, first one I've got here, this is in the pens and writing category category, kind of kicking it off. This is from Sweet Nightingale 2907 on YouTube. With brush pens, like the ones with the weasel hair, are you limited to using strictly cartridges, or can you get a converter to use bottled ink? And if so, since it's a different kind of tip, what is the best ink to use? Um, you actually have a lot more freedom with a brush pen than you do even with a fountain pen. Um, you don't want to go using calligraphy inks or anything like that. You don't have that much freedom. You still got to use fountain pen ink, but you don't run into the same kind of clogging and flow issues with a brush pen like you would uh, potentially with a fountain pen. So that's really, brush pens are really ideal for pigmented inks. Um, that's where a lot of them uh, really kind of shine because you don't have kind of a, a tight constricted flow through a feed like you would with a fountain pen. The brush is just kind of like bleh, the whole thing is like a big feed. So you can just, you know, kind of just is wet and you just kind of write with it however you want. Um, so that said, there's nothing about using a cartridge versus a converter that will matter at all with a brush pen. So you can use cartridges, you can use converter, whatever, as long as the pen takes you know, whatever it is. Um, you know, you said the one with weasel hair, I'm assuming, you know, um, the one that we have with weasel hair is a platinum one. You can definitely use a platinum converter and can cartridge and so on. You can switch back and forth, whatever you want. Um, but uh, there's nothing about a converter necessarily or bottled ink that is any different than using a cartridge. So as long as the pen will accept a converter, by all means, go nuts. Um, and then you said a uh, different kind of tip, what's the best ink to use? Um, pigmented ink is really where it shines, but you certainly don't require that. Um, I think in general, more saturated inks tend to work a little better, but um, it's not really as, as picky uh, as it is with a fountain pen. I'll be the first to say that I don't really have a whole lot of experience using brush pens with a variety of inks. This is not, I'm not an artist. I don't really use brush pens much other than just kind of test them out so I kind of know what's going on. Uh, but in general, I just really don't know much of what's going on with brush pens because I just don't use them in my daily life. Um, so you, there might be other people that can pipe in in the comments and stuff that can better answer that type of question. Um, so that's really about uh, all that I can share from personal experience about brush pens. Uh, next question I have is from Justin P on Facebook. I'm trying to decide between the 1.5 and the 1.1 for my Twisby 580. I've heard of flow issues with the 1.5. What are your thoughts? Um, I haven't really seen a drastically different number of, of issues with the 1.5 versus the 1.1 um, on the Twisby. At least nothing that I've like been able to track and say like, oh yeah, we have twice as many people that complain about the 1.5s as 1.1, whatever. Um, and it's also hard to track because the 1.5s are not as available. So you know, it's it's the kind of thing like I don't really know whether the ratio is the same or, or whatever because of the availability and just the popularity in, of the, that nib size. Um, I will say in general, probably the thing that should dictate more what you're going for is 
what is the actual tip size that you plan to use in your daily life. So, um, you know, 1.1, it tends to be a more practical, um, kind of everyday fountain pen nib size because it's a little, little thinner. Um, the 1.5 tends to get a little big for kind of normal daily writing unless you have pretty generous margins. If you're using like a Clairefontaine notebook with an eight millimeter margin, then you can get away with a 1.5. Uh, but if you're trying to use it on like a college ruled American grade paper, you know, like more absorbent kind of paper, that 1.5 is going to be kind of tough to use on a daily basis. You're going to want to stick with the 1.1 um, if you want that italic nib. Um, so that's kind of what I can say about that. I will say the 1.5, because it's a, it's a fatter nib, it's a little less forgiving in terms of like the rotation in your hand. I think based on my interactions with people and people, you know, Twisby is a, is a more affordable pen. So I think a lot of people tend to kind of jump in and get the Twisby without having a lot of fountain pen experience. Um, that's very much overgeneralizing, but I think I do see a lot more people than they would say a, a you know, Pelican or something much more expensive. Um, I think that, you know, a piston filling pen with a, a stub nib option like that, um, you're gonna see more people that are having some trouble purely because they need to practice with it and kind of get used to the pen. That's what ends up being a lot of times is we, we troubleshoot a lot and educate people about how to write with pens and so on. So that's, that's a lot of, I think, the general comments that you're reading online. There are certainly some people that are having some, some genuine flow issues and stuff. I know Twisby has switched their nibs in the past from Bach to Yovo, you know, different nib manufacturers, and they've had some things going on with some of the flow of their pens. So it's not that they've been like completely, you know, guilt-free. Uh, on anything, but um, I will say that Twisby has the one of the best, um, you know, warranty type responses of any of the companies. They, you know, they'll replace stuff really well. Um, you know, Philip Wang is uh, runs Twisby in the U.S. and he like handles a lot of that stuff personally. So he will, you know, get your replacements if a replacement is due. Um, he'll definitely hear you out and he does a lot of that stuff really responsibly. So, you know, yeah, sometimes there are some issues, but they always try to make them right. Um, so that's, that's usually what ends up going on with Twisby. So, um, you know, it's not that you should completely shy away from it, but, uh, you know, it's kind of be aware there's a small, small potential for that to happen. And if it does, Twisby will make it right. So, you know, don't let it, don't let it completely hold you back from pulling the trigger, but if you're on the fence, maybe give it some little more thought. Um, and then uh, I think that, you know, in general, Twisby's um, going to be moving away from 1.5. So I've sort of I've heard rumblings anyway. I mean, I know a lot of the newer pens they've been releasing haven't even had a 1.5 option. You know, I don't know if it's, uh, if it's correlated to anything to do with flow or anything like that. It might, I think, I personally think it's just more popularity. The 1.5 is just across the board on all nib sizes are just not nearly as popular as the 1.1. So next question, I've uh, got several ink questions for this week. So that's kind of cool. Um, first ink question I had this week. Uh, this is from Janet L on Facebook. Uh, an occasionally suggested alternative to cartridge converters is refilling a disposable cartridge with an ink syringe, especially for pens like the Kaweco All Sport. Can this be done indefinitely or does the cartridge eventually wear out? And approximately how many times can you refill a disposable cartridge before you have to toss it? Uh, it's a great question. You know, that is definitely, the Kaweco All Sport is certainly one where you really kind of need to do that unless you convert it to an eyedropper which is possible. Um, you know, that's something that uh, is certainly uh, a benefit of that particular pen. It's very easy to convert to an eyedropper. You don't even need an O-ring, just a little silicone grease on the threads and you're all set. I have a separate video on doing that. It's a very old video, but it's there. Sorry, I'm really thirsty today. Um, but uh, yeah, refilling cartridge is definitely a very legitimate practice. A lot of people do it. Not quite as convenient as having a converter or an eyedropper pen, but um, it definitely works. Uh, there, your instinct is right though, that um, you definitely will, uh, I'm glad you're thinking along the lines of, of needing replacement cartridges because they will not last indefinitely. You know, the, the cartridges are made to be, essentially be thrown out. So they make them sturdy enough to, you know, be able to last a little bit and be carried in transit and stuff like that. But they are not made out of like the same, you know, kind of hard plastic that most converters are made out of. They're made out of a much softer plastic that will definitely crack and wear and, and wear out over time. Um, usually what will happen is they'll either crack along the, the edges if you're like 
Um, I, I, I did it before where sometimes when I'm using cartridges to kind of prime it and get it going, I'll squeeze the cartridge and kind of force ink through. Um, and if you do that, you know, after two or three fillings, that converter is going to be shot because you're, you're really stressing that thing pretty hard. Um, just with normal use though, usually where it's going to wear out is right around the opening end where it fits onto the back of the feed. Um, you know, that's, it's, you're putting a lot of pressure on there. It's only friction fit held onto the back of that feed, uh, the cartridges. So that's going to wear out first. Um, how long it's going to last is going to depend on which cartridge you're talking about because they're not all created equal. Um, standard international cartridges, that's what the Kaweco takes. And uh, it really depends on how you fill it and, and just the particular pen because, yes, all standard international pens will fit a standard international cartridge, but some of them are a little little tighter fitting than others so if it's a tighter fit it's not going to last as long because it's going to be stressed more and so on um, but uh, i would say in general expect maybe five five to ten fillings um you know from a single cartridge before it kind of wears out and uh you know that could always vary you know wildly so that's just kind of i think a safe bet for you um somewhere in that range so you know if you're if you're going to be buying one cartridge and thinking that's going to last you as long as a converter it's just not going to be the case. It would be like if you had a pack of cartridges and you used them all up and saved all of those little extra cartridges and then clean them out and um, reuse them, they would last you for a while, uh, but you would eventually need to replace them as well. So, you know, it's definitely the kind of thing that uh, it can be done, but it's not, uh, it's not going to be the same durability as a converter. Next question. Poti on Facebook asks, is the Pilot Parallel Pen mixable ink truly mixable i mean not simply by touching the nibs together but mix it like normal ink mixing uh, so i'm assuming you're talking about like not in a pen uh, you know you're taking the ink mixing it together in a vial or something like that uh, i believe so there's no reason that i would believe that it wouldn't be i haven't extracted a lot of that ink out of cartridges and tried mixing it to see what happens but i don't see any reason why it wouldn't be mixable just like normal ink is mixable because it, the design, the ink is designed to, you know, you know, transfer from one pen to another. It's designed to be mixed in the pen, so um, there's no. I've never heard of anybody having a problem mixing it otherwise, but I've never really heard of anybody mixing it otherwise outside the pen either. Uh, but certainly, it could be done. Uh, however, it's not super practical. Um, maybe you know, you could probably do it, but. Um, the, the thing with, with that is, though, is another question that I get asked a lot is, can the Pilot Parallel mixable cartridges be used in non-Pilot Parallel pens? Um, and if you look at the verbiage on the box, on the back of those cartridges, it says not to use them in anything but the Parallel. So I'm struggling to see necessarily what exactly is the benefit um, of doing what you're asking, uh, honestly, because you would be extracting ink out of the cartridges themselves, mixing them separately, and then going back and using them in a parallel. So I guess if you wanted a, just a different shade of that ink in a parallel, but you didn't want to have the gradation effect that you do when touching the nibs together, that would be the reason to do that in the parallel. But that, to me, seems like a slightly less practical way uh, to do it than it would be than just having other bottled inks or other ink samples or whatever and mixing them and just using them in a parallel um, and then whatever other pen you want. So yeah, technically you could do uh, what you're asking, um, but you know because of the properties of that ink, it has it can have some flow issues when you're using it in a non-parallel pen. The parallel pen is a pretty open feed system in it. Um, it tends to have some flow issues when you use it in something like a Metropolitan or a Falcon or something else. Uh, so uh, I know Pilot doesn't recommend doing that. Um, so that's where I think I'll leave you off at that. And the ink that's in those cartridges uh, is not in bottled form. So it's really only in those cartridges that you're, you're dealing with that. Uh, Jacob A. on Facebook asked, is it possible to mix Noodler's Blue Ghost with other Noodler's inks to get a fountain pen ink that shows up on paper and is blacklight fluorescent? Uh, yes, yes, you can do that. <coughs> Blue Ghost, for those of you that aren't aware of it, it's an invisible ink. Um, literally, when you write with it, it's clear and you cannot see it. The only time that you can see that ink is when you have a black light or some kind of UV fluorescent light. It'll glow under a black light. 
Um, why would you need that? Well, there's lots of reasons. You could have a lot of fun with that. Um, but uh, there's a there's two kind of two main reasons. One is if you want to write basically secret messages, um, you can do that. A uh, cool story I ever heard was uh, you know an engaged couple where um, the the gentleman was uh, overseas in the military and uh, his fiance would write him a normal letter and then have like all the secret lovey-dovey kind of stuff written in Blue Ghost so that he wouldn't get hassled by his buddies when the letter would inevitably get stolen and then read out loud in front of his, uh, you know, in front of his company. So it was a uh, uh, kind of a neat, neat little story there. So you could do things like that. A lot of kids love to play with it, write secret messages. I mean, that's just super fun right there. Um, but the other, the other benefit to Blue Ghost is for, and I think this might even be part of Nathan's original intention when he created the ink, um, is for fraud resistance um, because you have uh, a bullet blue ghost. It's UV fluorescent. That's true. It's also bulletproof, so it's a permanent ink. So you can mix it with a non-permanent ink, and it can give you permanent qualities to it. Mainly, okay. So you can't really like see the permanent qualities because if you're mixing. Just in general, if you're mixing a bulletproof or a permanent ink with a non-permanent ink, then when you wash it, the non-permanent ink will completely wash away and all that will be left behind is the permanent one. Um, that's why some of the inks that you see that are like semi-permanent or, you know, like some of the color will wash away but other color, colors will stay. That's because certain dye components within that individual ink are permanent and others are not. Uh, case in point, Liberty's Elysium, uh, the one that I helped develop that's like the shade of blue that's like of these walls here. Uh, that ink is partially bulletproof. So some of the components are bulletproof, some of them are not. So when you wash it away, it fades and a lot of the vibrant blue washes away, but there's a darker blue that stays and will not move. And that's the part that's permanent. So Nathan called it semi semi bulletproof or partially bulletproof. Um, when you're mixing inks with different properties, that's the same kind of situation you're in. In this case, Blue Ghost is a transparent ink. So in terms of like fraud resistance, you really can't tell unless it's something like you're writing checks or whatever and the banks are checking with any kind of a UV light or something like that or you're trying to prove whether something had ever been signed and it was washed away. Um, that Blue Ghost will excuse me, will stay behind and will give you proof that yes, that person did actually sign their signature and then they tried to wash it away. So um, that's uh, something that you can, you can check out there. Um, so yeah, you can go nuts and have a lot of fun with um, the Blue Ghost. Uh, the one thing that I will say is if you're mixing it, just like the mixing of the properties, you're mixing of the colors too. So if you're mixing any colors together, you're always gonna get a blend of whatever it looks like. So if you're using something that isn't UV fluorescent and you're mixing a UV fluorescent ink into it, it's not going to fluoresce as much as it would if it was just that fluorescent ink. So the Blue Ghost is gonna really pop on the black light. Um, but if you're mixing it with another ink that's not fluorescent, it's only gonna be like 50% fluorescence or whatever ratio that you end up mixing it. So you'll get the fluorescent properties but it won't be quite as vibrant as it would if it was the fully fluorescent ink. All right, next question I have is from Facebook and forgive me, I cannot, I cannot read your, your name because it is uh, characters. So um, forgive me for that, but um, you did have a great question. Which of the Noodler's four and a half ounce bottles come with a preppy and which with the pen from Noodler's? Does it change over time? I love the eyedropper pens from Noodlers and have long since given up on preppies because of how easily the caps crack. And I'm perfectly willing to purchase large quantities of ink of a color I like that I probably won't even get around to using for years just for more of those pens. Okay, so I went and pulled a whole bunch of pens because I've been saving them um, over the years. So first thing I wanna say about these pens that come with the Noodlers four and a half ounce inks is they are inconsistent, okay? And we used to photograph everything with the pen uh, and we stopped doing that because we would get such a variety and things would change constantly and um, you know, it's really difficult to communicate through the entire distribution chain when Nathan makes a change and then he sends it out because then you get mixed stock and things go, he has a distributor uh, in Texas. So he has all the ink that comes from you know, Massachusetts where he is, it goes to Texas and then it gets mailed out to all the retailers like me. And what happens is when he makes a change, if it's like a permanent change, 
it goes out, there might be some stock that's left to the distributor, there might be some stock that's left at the retailers. So by the time it gets to the distributor and then kind of gets distributed out, you know, then you may see it come at some point to the retailers and then at some point it goes out to individuals. So it takes a while for things to actually get filtered through and really change once a change is made all the way from the manufacturer. Um, and that said, you know, sometimes things change and then they change back. And Nathan will sometimes ship partial shipments with some things. And, um, you know, he is a one man operation. And the thing to keep in mind with all of these is they're free pens. Like, literally, they're free pens. He does not change the price of these inks just because he includes a pen. Um, the price that he sets for his inks include the dyes, and then he includes the ink or he includes the pen in there if he's able. Um, so things have changed over time and a lot of the reasons he's gone towards changing which pens he includes in the ink has been because of cost purposes because he, he doesn't have a lot of margin to work with on these inks. And the fact he's including an entire free pen with like an $18 bottle of ink or $19 bottle of ink, um, it makes it very difficult for him to be able to do that if there's any fluctuation in price on the preppy or on anything. You know, um, so I'll show you some of these pens just so you can understand a little bit of the history, but that's kind of my blanket disclaimer is we have gotten away from really essentially promising anything because stuff changes and a lot of times we don't even know because we just cannot open up every single four and a half ounce pen uh, or ink that comes with a pen as it comes through our shop. It is impractical for us to do that we would have to charge you with more money to make up for the time that my staff would be spending doing that to be able to, to do that. And it's just not worth it for a free pen like that. So it kind of has to just come as it does. We, we do our best to keep up with it when those changes are made, um, but it's really been a challenge and almost impossible to do recently. So um, what you may have traditionally always known has been the Platinum Preppy. Um, which I have right here. And I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. Um, and I actually set up an external monitor over here so I can really see. Because a lot of times when I zoom in, stuff gets out of focus. Like it focuses on my face. Oh, there you go. It focuses on my face, but not on the pen. So this is the traditional Platinum Preppy, which is unmarked. Normally there's markings all over it. And this is actually the old style Preppy. They've actually changed and updated the Platinum Preppy since this style. But this is what had been around for years, coming with a lot of the four and a half ounce Noodler's inks. Now this particular one is a special one because it has a rollerball tip. Normally what would come in this, it would have a black nib. It's a fine nib. That's what traditionally came with it. And it would may or may not have a rollerball tip, um, depending on the type of ink that it was. Heart of Darkness came with a rollerball tip for a while, Base State Blue did, uh, and that might be it. But um, the rollerball tip thing uh, is basically not happening anymore. So cost of the rollerball tips went up so much, Nathan can't do it anymore. So almost nothing comes with a rollerball tip anymore. Um, but swapping that out is, is pretty easy between the two pens, um, you know, when it does happen like that, because you just, you know, pull it out and press it back in there. Um, but this is the general style that everybody's been familiar with. So um, it's a, an O-ring, uh, silicone grease on here. So it's basically prepped up, ready to go. It does not have a post for a cartridge or a converter um, because Nathan yanks those out of there. Or maybe he gets it made without it. I don't know. Uh, last When I talked to him like four years ago about it, he said that he was yanking them all out. Maybe he got to the point where he was able to have platinum just not even include it in the first place, but um, he just made it purely an eyedropper pen. Um, and then it's got, uh, you know, the black uh, fine nib. So that was what was always coming for a while. And then if you look several years ago, I came out with a video um, of this new style of Noodler's pen. And it was just, uh, you know, perhaps a sign of things to come over the next several years of um, Nathan changing things and uh, me not getting the memo on that. So um, I randomly checked Nikita back when I was in working out of my garage and I was wearing my glasses and it was very late at night and I was very tired, but it's a, somewhat of a popular video, but it showed a new style of Noodler's pen that was coming out. And this pen has never been sold. It's only come with the four and a half ounce inks as a free pen. So here it is. It's got um, a unique kind of Noodler's nib on it that's not available elsewhere. See, the thing's trying to focus on my face. It just wants to see my face. Maybe I should hold it further back. Um, but it's got a unique Noodler's nib there. Um, you know, it's not a flex nib. It's just a normal nib. 
Um, it's got, you know, a body, it's a, a body on here that's eyedropper and it's got an O-ring and grease and everything just like normal, but it's uh, color matched. So there was a red version and there's actually several other different colors. I'm going to show you right now. Don't go crazy because I know some of you like to collect all these colors. Um, but here we go. Let me see if I can show you the Bam. There's all the colors. So um, there's a red, kind of a yellowish, orangish, gold kind of thing, silver, blue, and a green. Um, and these would come in a few of the different Noodler's four and a half ounce inks. What was uh, kind of you know crazy about this is like for a while it was just one and then a couple and then it'd be preppies and they'd change over and then he would run out of one color so he'd change to another one and trying to keep up of not only which pen was in there but what color of pen, it was a nightmare. Um, so in, uh, <laughs> I believe now that these pens are no longer economical for him or something happened where the manufacturer is not able to do them anymore or there's a quality issue or something like that. I don't know the full details. But Nathan is now no longer going to be having these in any of them either. So these are phasing out. And what we're seeing now is a preppy that actually has a Noodler's Inc. logo written on it. Um, and it's still got the black cap, still eyedropper converted with the, the post and everything that's removed. Um, and instead of a black nib, it has a silver nib, fine nib. Um, and this is what we're seeing now in a lot of the pens. Um, uh, Nathan has talked about um, going to a different model of Noodler's pen. This right here is the infamous Charlie pen that you may have heard about. Um, that we're in, We only got 40 bottles of this ink a while ago in one shipment and it was gone in like 20 minutes. It was insane. Um, so this pen is a simpler version of the older Noodler's ink. Um, it's kind of reminiscent of a nib creeper, but without a piston mechanism. And uh, it, this yellowing here is a reaction, I guess, somehow between the, the black and the clear. That's, that's what's going on there. Um, but we only had a few of these pens. Technically, I guess we only sold 39 because I kept one of them. Um, but uh, not a flex nib either, just a normal nib. It does have an ebonite feed though. And uh, it's, this particular Charlie pen is like a rainbow kind of multicolored cap. Um, but uh, we may, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw this body style coming out on more of these four and a half ounce inks with a different color caps or something like that. I don't know. I think that this pen was kind of an experiment for Nathan to see. Of course, with so few pens, I don't know what it's really seeing because they were gone anyway because people just wanted to collect them. Um, and then the other thing that was included, this is not a Noodler's pen, but this is a brush pen that used to come in a couple of inks, we used to have it with Kung De Chang, Whaleman Sepia, and Bay State Blue. That is not the case anymore because um, the price of this went up. It's a Kiritaki brush pen. So it's a dis kind of a disposable brush pen, I believe it's considered to be. It's Japanese and uh, it's eyedropper. So you just, you know, put the ink in here and then you screw it on here and it's got, um, you know, a brush, synthetic brush tip. Um, so, you know, just kind of gives you another option there. And that's something that we've never sold uh, beyond just the ink as well. So that's kind of the, the history of the Noodler's pens. Uh, as to answer your question as to what's coming out right now, I could go back in the warehouse, I could look through every single bottle of ink and I'd probably see a variety. So um, it's really frustrating, I know, for you to not know what you're gonna get. And believe me, it's frustrating for me to not know what I have on my shelves. Um, but it's just not practical. It's not it's not economical for me to be able to go through and look at every single one as they're coming in when they change so much. Um, and the history of these things has been kind of all over the place. So uh, as much as I hate to say it, that's the best I can do. So you really, it's if you're trying to collect them, it's going to be frustrating. And, I, and I'm really sorry about that. Um, you know, if you if you contact our, our customer care team, a lot of times they'll be willing to go back and check, you know, and that's the best that I think I can do is if you are looking for a specific free pen, as much as my team is probably gonna, <laughs> probably gonna be annoyed with me offering this uh, to you, but you know, if you email us, that's, I mean, we do that kind of stuff, you know, all the time, because we, we go above and beyond, um, even when sometimes it's, it's uh, you know, you know, specific requests like that. But if you're asking like, hey, what pen is coming in Heart of Darkness right now? I wanna buy a, a bottle of ink and we can go back and we can check 
and let you know. Um, but it's not something that we can like get out through social media anymore because it changes so much that it's inconsistent and then people get two week old information and it's changed and they get frustrated and return it and whatever. So it's, it's tough, but that's, that's uh, at least I was able to show you kind of what's going on with all the different pens and maybe give you some idea of what you can probably expect. All right, I uh, got some troubleshooting questions, a few good ones. Um, Travis W on Facebook asked, I love my E95S, but it's tough to clean and swap inks with it, especially since it only takes a squeeze converter. Is there an easy way to clean squeeze converters? And is it more difficult to flush out hooded nibs? My bulb syringe doesn't seem to clean the ink out of the nib unit completely. Um, so I grabbed the Pilot E95S, which is the pen that you have in question. I'm gonna zoom back in, you get to see my stubbly chin again. Uh, but anyway, here's the pen, the Pilot E95S. Um, this happens to be an extra fine, um, but it's a really cool pen. It's really kind of a pocket pen. Um, I've got a full video on this if you wanna check it out in detail. So I won't really go into a lot of detail about it. Um, the one thing that I will show is the nib, you can see here, you, you, know, you called it a hooded nib, it's really not a hooded nib. Um, this is what I would call an inlaid nib. Hooded nib is when you actually have a covering that goes over top of it and you just see a little bit of exposed, such as in the Lamy 2000. That's one of the most recognizable hooded nibs that's available today. Um, but it's an inlaid nib. And then you have the filling mechanism here, which you just unscrew this blind cap and it has a Pilot Con 20 converter that comes with it. Now you might be asking yourself, hey, can I fit a Pilot Con 50? This is kind of their flagship converter on most of their other pens. Um, can you fit that on there? And the answer is no, because there is this kind of stepped up portion at the metal band uh, on the converter and you cannot fit it in the pen. It kind of stops it right there. It doesn't allow it to actually grip on and be able to be usable. So that is unfortunate because then that leaves you the only choice is with the Con 20. Now it's not all bad because the Con 20 has uh, a higher ink capacity than the Con 50, so it's you know you are getting some added ink benefit there. But you're right, it is a little tougher to clean out because you can't see it and there's no piston or anything. Um, there's really two methods that you can do to clean this thing out easiest. One of them is to use an ink syringe and you can just kind of psh, psh, you know flush it out. The ink syringe allows the needle to get back in there, and as you flush water through, it kind of pushes from the back and then comes out this way. So it really helps to kind of flush out the, con the converter that way. Or the other method that I most often use myself is I get some, I take the converter off when I go to clean the pen, I fill it with water, and then I put my thumb over it and I shake the living daylights out of it, and then I dump it out. And then I do that repeatedly five or six times and then it's pretty clean after that. And then if you want to, you can take a Q-tip as well and kind of jam that thing down in there. It won't get all the way back in the back, but if you get, uh, you know, you take a Q-tip and you kind of like flatten it out, thin it out a little bit, then you can reach it down in there and kind of scrub it out too. That's another way that you can um, be able to clean this thing out a little easier. <coughs> Excuse me, that was not a sneeze, that was a cough, but it's okay, just in case you felt the need to say gazoon type. Um, so there's the converter, and then the other question that you had about this particular pen was, how do you flush this thing out with a bulb syringe? Um, the bulb syringe fits on here pretty well. I don't have a bulb syringe at the ready. Should have thought about that, but sorry. Still getting settled in. I don't have like everything normally at hand like I would in my old office, but um, you know you can use a bulb syringe to flush this thing out. However, the water when you're flushing it through is going to take the path of least resistance, and th that on this pen specifically is going to be out of your filler hole. That's actually the situation usually with most pens. Um, if you, the faster you force it out, the more likely it's going to want to be to come out of the filler hole and not actually through the nib. So the thing that you can do to help with that is go slower, just flush a little bit slower and allow the ink to actually come through that feed channel. Um, the other thing that you can do if you are deck style, deck, deck style, that's not even a word. If you have the dexterity um, is actually use your finger to cover the filler hole. You know, you can like cover it like that maybe and then use the bulb syringe and kind of flush it out and it'll, it'll block that and f make the path of least resistance to then be through the, um, you know, the, the writing portion of the nib. Um, so that's another option for you um, as well. Or another thing that I've done too is I've kind of like filled it with water and then just like taken a paper towel to it and kind of wicked it through a little bit. You can do that as well. So lots of options for you on the E95S. This is something that, you know, it's not specifically unique to that pen. Um, it could be 
others as well that have that kind of same situation going on with the the ink or the water that as you're flushing with a with a bulb syringe doesn't go all the way through, but um, that that same kind of general practice of you know flushing through the filler hole um, is something that you can translate and use on some of your other pens. Let's see here. Ren R on Facebook asked and said, "I have a Lamy Z26. After one use in my Lamy Nex, it doesn't seem to fit snugly in my Lamy Vista. It fits loosely, and any light tap will dislodge the Z26 from the Vista." My Z24s all worked fine with the Vista and other Lamy pens. I'm wondering if it's a Z26 thing. Okay, so there's two different Lamy converters, the Z24 and the Z26. The Z24 is the one that you probably have seen the most. I'll zoom back in again. Lots of zooming in and out today. So the Z24 is the red and black one, this kind of traditional one that you've seen a lot. Um, this is the Z26. This one you don't see quite as much because it only comes on... Uh, the Lamy Studio, the Pure, the Logo, the CP1, um, and maybe something else like the Scala, you know, stuff like that. Um, but the the Vista, the Safari, the All Star, they, you know, the ABC, the Nex, they'll have the Z24. Um, the way that these things work, you know, when you have a Vista or something like that that takes a Z24, you can also use a Z26 on it because the Z24 has these little pegs on it that latch in to these little protuberances, to quote Michael Scott, um, that will kind of lock it in there and make it really tight. So that helps tremendously. When you are using a Z26, it does not have those pegs. So you're really relying only on the friction of the end of this to fit on here. And honestly, like I'm fitting it on here and until I get to that last millimeter, it's not grabbing onto much. So yes, technically it will fit on here. And while this one, it won't go anywhere. Um, certainly if it sees a lot of wear or it gets put on a different pen that maybe just has a slight tolerance that was a little bit bigger that this thing fits more snugly on when you go to put it back on a pen like the Vista or whatever it then wouldn't grip as tightly and it would end up in your kind of situation if that's a situation you got to go back to the Z24 you just don't have a choice unless you want to buy another Z26 and wait for it to happen again so yeah you can use the Z26 in this aesthetically you might like it a little more because it's kind of a demonstrator pen and you may not like the red in the back of the Vista I totally get that but you know what? It's just that that's the situation you're gonna be in. It's just not really made to fit on this pen kind of permanently. Um, another option would be to get cartridges and just refill cartridges and use it if you really just can't stand the red converter. Um, just you refill your Lamy cartridges and Lamy cartridges have a really good ink capacity too. So that's also kind of nice. All right, zoom out again. Bouncing all over the place today. Our next question I have, Eric O on Facebook said, uh, Brian mentioned singing nibs in the past. I just got in on the Vanishing Point nib sale and got a medium nib that squeaks or sings using Noodler's 54th. Thoughts on how to fix it? The nib seems to hard start a bit. See if it gets better with time. Um, well, let's see here. Um, it, that could be something if you're dealing with like hard starting and stuff like that. Could be a variety of things, um, the nib singing, something like that. Yes, it could be a nib thing. The singing nibs, I've really only seen those on like medium and broader nibs. I almost never see that on finer nibs. Um, I think maybe it just has to do with the way that it's ground or something like that. I don't know. I'm not a nibmeister, so I don't know all the ins and outs of how that kind of stuff works, but my assumption is that the reason the nibs are singing is because there's obviously some kind of like vibration that's happening. You know, it's kind of like if you have a tuning fork or if you have a, you know, I don't know, xylophone or glockenspiel or something like that. When you're hitting it, anything that's metal that's making a noise, it's because it's vibrating back and forth very quickly. So when you're writing with a pen and it's making a squeaky noise, it's because there's metal there that's vibrating very quickly and making that audible squeak. That's just physically, that's what is happening. Um, now, exactly why, I don't know. It probably has to do with the way it's ground. Maybe it just wasn't ground quite smooth enough in the right place and just the way that you happen to be holding it and happen to be using it, it's just hitting it in the right spot that's making it squeak. Um, usually, a little bit of rub on a Mylar paper or a micro mesh if it was really bad 
that will take care of that. Um, doesn't even need a lot, just a little bit will do it. Um, and honestly, it's just, you know, using it over time will probably just wear it away. Depends on how much you use it and so on, stuff like that. But, you know, paper is actually very, very, very slightly abrasive. Very slightly abrasive. Um, if you look down, like, you know, microscopically at paper, it's, it's very, um, you know, it's, it looks very smooth, but then it looks kind of rocky when you get, uh, when you, it looks kind of rough when you get down to it. So that said, um, if you just use it over time, that squeak will probably get better and better and better until it eventually goes away. If you really want to get it away, a little bit of mylar paper um, is, is often all that's needed. If it's really bothersome and you're getting hard starting and this, it's singing and all this other kind of stuff, um, I would either return that. If you got it from us, we'll take it back. Um, or if you got it elsewhere, contact whoever you got it from, let them know the issue. Hopefully they'll take it back. Um, or uh, you can send it directly to pilots and they'll swap it out. They're, they're pretty okay about that kind of stuff. Um, so that is pretty much what's going on there. I don't think that it necessarily has to do anything with the ink. Maybe on some inks it'll be better than others. If you have a more lubricated ink, it might be less likely to do that, but I really don't think it has anything to do with your 54th. Um, but uh, that's, that's pretty much how it's gonna go. Got some business questions. No paper questions this week. None. No paper questions. So, if you got paper questions, you know you must be uh, either not not asking them to me, or you know, maybe you're just happy. Maybe you're you're all good on your paper. But anyway, got business questions. Kenneth C on Facebook said, "Have you ever considered carrying additional models from Jin Hao? I know some of their designs are ridiculous, and others are blatant knockoffs." but they have several other nice designs, such as the 15, the 8802, and the 500. Um, I'm open to carrying more models of Jin Hao. The reason I went with the 450 and the 750 first is because those are the ones that were most talked about and that had gotten kind of the best reviews and they're not a knockoff or anything too crazy. They're pretty conventional. So um, I had kind of you know, just looked at reviews that people had done and a lot of people talking about them on Fountain Pen Network and various blogs and stuff, so I thought, you know, that might be a good one to start. Um, and then we eventually got the 159 as well. Now the 159 is kind of, it's, it's kind of a knockoff of the Mont Blanc 149. It's, it's not a counterfeit or copycat or something. It's, it's different enough where, you know, it's, it's, I would say it's inspired from the 149, but it's not, it's not meant to be a exact copycat and it really isn't uh, at all. You know, it's especially because that's like a, almost a thousand dollar pen that you're getting for you know, that the, the, the Mont Blanc 149 and the Jin Hao is $12.50. So it's so clearly not intended to be counterfeit. Um, so that's the only other one. And, and I just, I truly like that pen just kind of for what it is. There are a lot of other models. There's ones that have like, dr like three dimensional dragons around them and stuff like that, which honestly I think is kind of cool. But the challenge is um, we have to buy them in such high quantities it's really unreal the quantities we have to buy them in. So um, you know, if we want it, if we want to carry a variety of different models, and the high quantities, by the way, are per nib size. Um, they do make a fine nib in the gin house. We chose to go with medium because we thought that the mediums would be, you know, probably less troublesome. <laughs> you know, the fines, the quality of the fine nibs, I I felt in my gut might be. Uh, a little more spotty. I don't know that for a fact, but that's kind of where my gut was telling me. So we went with the mediums. Um, that's another possible option we could do is to get those pens, the pens we already have with fine nibs. But again, quantities are super high and it's per nib size that we have to buy these high quantities. So it's, it just makes it a real challenge. And you know, we carry Goulet nibs that fit them as well. So if you really wanted a different nib size, you could put a stub, you can get an extra fine, all that. So we figured the fact that we had that was was the best that we could do for right now, um, unless they just become so popular that we think that we could sell a variety of models and nib sizes. But um, that is a that is a big challenge with Jinhao. There is no uh, there is no U.S. distributor or anything. We have to buy them direct from China, which means massive quantities. So it's a big risk for us to take on something untested, and there really isn't a way for us to test them because we have to buy huge quantities to even get started. Um, so yes, I am definitely open to carrying other models. Uh, but I gotta have a pretty pretty solid feeling that it's gonna be popular enough, and not even like wildly popular, but like 
just popular enough to be for me so I'm not sitting on them for 10 years you know um, so that's that's definitely the biggest challenge I don't want to go I don't want to go uh, you know inventory poor because I'm buying massive quantities of pens that would take forever to sell it's just a, a business move that I have to be able to make so um, you know the 15 8802 the 500 I'll look into these and I'll see I'll check them out um, but uh, if you are interested in general on any gin house that um, you don't see us with Please ask, because the more of you that ask and the more people we see that are buying them overseas and posting reviews and all that kind of thing, and we could really see that there would be a great benefit to make them available in the U.S., um, the more likely we will be able to carry them. Next question I have is from Mark Greg on YouTube. Brian and Rachel, have you ever considered retailing Monteverde Napa fountain pens? I would love to see them in your lineup. Uh, well, Mark, you are a couple of years too late. We used to carry them. Um, but they're actually discontinued. They're not going to be uh, made anymore. So um, we stopped carrying them, oh man, two years ago maybe? They were kind of on the outs when we were um, first getting into them. But we stocked up on them. We carried, there were three different models, I think. And uh, they did okay, but they were kind of expensive uh, for what they are. And they just really didn't sell well for us. I think just the aesthetics or something with, along with the price just didn't do it for most people. Um, so we discontinued them just because of poor sales after six or nine months of carrying them. And we get like one person every now and then that asks about them. But, you know, if I figured this would be an easy enough question for me to answer for you. So we're not going to be carrying them again because they're not even going to be available uh, at some point. I'm sure they have some level of stock that's going to clear out eventually. But I... I didn't like, I didn't, since I got your question here, I didn't go and confirm anything with Monteverde. Maybe I could have done that, but um, I haven't, uh, I haven't been told that they're bringing it back or anything. And I thought it was like a year ago that I heard that they were being discontinued. So maybe they haven't discontinued it yet, or maybe they um, did and they just have a lot of stock, or maybe they don't have a lot of stock and they're just really aren't selling anywhere, so they still seem available everywhere. Um, I don't know, but that's that's the situation going on with the Napa. Got another great question from Facebook. I think it's the same one that I had uh, earlier uh, with the characters that uh, you know I really can't, don't I really don't read characters at all, but I believe it's the same. So forgive me again um, on Facebook. So. Good questions, though. Um, do you know why Noodlers doesn't sell the non-flex nib creepers anymore? Um, yes, I do know why. I may have even uh, I may have even had a hand in some of that. Honestly, um, not even indirectly, quite directly. Um, so uh, it was a few years back. So. A long time ago, when Nathan uh, first started coming out with pens, uh, believe it or not, Noodlers used to never sell pens. Um, they were just ink. So um, shortly after we started carrying Noodlers ink, this would have been in 2010, we started carrying it in September of 2010. Um, like right around that time, Nathan was experimenting with coming out some pens. He may have done like one test batch of pens um, around that time, very small, like 20 pens or something, just to test the waters. Um, and he had these, you know, what is now the Noodler's Nib Creeper, but with a different nib, as a non-flex nib. Actually one very similar to uh, what you see on the Charlie pen. Um, so it was just a standard nib. Let me just see if I can zoom in and get you a little, any, any bit of a closer picture. So it was not this particular pen, but it was a nib similar to this, where it just said Noodler's Ink across it, very conventional looking nib, number two size. Um, with a breather hole, um, and that was it. So that was the nib creeper originally. There was no flex pen. Ooh, zoomed out too far. There was no flex pen. Uh, it was just that nib creeper, and it was shortly after that, a few months after that, where he started experimenting with these flex pens. And the flex pens just really started driving people crazy um, in a good way. The people really wanted them bad. We would only get like a test batch every four to six months. So we would have like no Noodler's Flex Pens. You know, everybody, it, it wasn't as widely known about them at the time, but anyone who knew anything about Flex wanted to get one of these pens because it was a $14 Flex. The only cheaper option uh, at that time for anything modern was the, the Falcon, the Pilot, or at, at that time the Namiki Falcon, which around that time was about $120, $130. It's gone up a little bit since then. Uh, but, you know, that was quite a drastic difference in price. So, 
you know, anybody who was interested in trying Flex without investing a hundred and some dollars wanted a Noodler's pen. Uh, but there were none to be found because he was he would come out with very small batches. He would heat set every nib, every feed himself. It would just take him time. Um, so it really wasn't for a while until the flex pens even started to be able to come with any sort of availability whatsoever. This was way before the Conrad or the Ahab even came out. We're just talking that smaller nib creeper pen. Um, so what eventually ended up happening? He came out with the um, I believe he came out with the Ahab. And the, the nib creeper was available in both formats, or I'm trying to remember now the timing of when that happened, but that original nib creeper with the non-flex nib wasn't available that long. I wanna say it was nine months or maybe a year. I'm trying to remember if there was an overlap between the non-flex creeper and the Ahab, because I know the Ahab came out around November of 2011. Um, but uh, I, I honestly can't remember. I want to say now as I'm thinking about it, it was probably like mid-2011 when he made the decision to discontinue the non-flex creeper. Um, and essentially what it was boiling down to was he was heat setting these nibs, uh, or sorry, heat setting the feeds to the nibs and so on. He would only get so many nibs. He would only be able to allocate so much of his time and his you know factory where stuff was being made to make these pens. Um, and it was basically a decision between do I make flex pens or do I make non-flex pens? It was like one or the other, because we would like get flex pens and then we wouldn't get them for a while. We'd get the nib, nib creepers, normal ones back in, and then we, those would sell out and we'd get flex pens back in. So it was like this pendulum swinging, ping-ponging back and forth between flex and non-flex. And I was like, look, Nathan, man, everybody and their cousin wants your flex pens. There's some demand for your non-flex, but not nearly what there is for the demand, like literally like a hundredfold demand for the flex pens over the regular ones. And so he, I was talking to him on the phone and he was asking me, he was like, look, he's like, I just can't make all of them at once. He's like, it's one or the other. And I was like, well, Nathan, if it's one or the other, no question, you gotta make the flex pens. Like that's where the demand is. So he was like, okay, that's what I'll do. Um, so he stopped making the, the nib creeper and just focus, or the, the non-flex and just focused purely on the flex. And then he got working on the Ahab and then eventually the Conrad and all that. And the regular nib creeper just kind of dropped off and never, never came back, never became enough of a priority again. Do I think it could sell now? Sure, I think the brand recognition of Noodlers is such that, yeah, definitely people would be interested in a non-flex version of that nib creeper. Um, you know, but I, I don't think that it's gonna be worth Nathan's time to do it just based on what I know about his situation and um, the demand that I think there would be for that exact pen with a non-flex. Um, you know, especially because now you can get a $2 non-flex nib that you can, number six size, that you can put in the Ahab and the Conrad, which are much more popular models anyway. So for the cost of $20 for an Ahab or Conrad with a $2 add-on for a non-flex nib, you know, as opposed to $14 for a nib creeper, it's just, you know, I, I can't imagine it's gonna be Nathan, it's gonna be worth Nathan's time to do that. Not because he's like so important, whatever, but it's like literally a matter of he's one guy. So he either, you know, makes more Noodler's Black and Bay State Blue and, you know, Apache Sunset and things that are really bad if we run out of them, or he makes these other like peripheral pens that just isn't as much demand. So it's, it's just supply and demand. There's some demand for these pens, but not enough to justify Nathan giving up something else in order to do it because he truly is at capacity and has been for some time. All right, next question I've got. Um, oh, we get some personal ones now. So, yes. Um, got a few personal questions as we kind of wrap up, bring some things home. Got a nice long Q&A for today too, so this is good. Even though I'm uh, a little less active on some of the other videos, I'm still be able to give you plenty of Q&A, so I feel good about that. Um, some personal questions, I got three of them, so we'll see if I get, get time. I have 53 minutes so far, so we'll see how much time I get to wrap them all up. That's honestly part of the reason I set up, I have a second monitor over here, um, and part of the reason I set that up is because when with my new office setup, I can't see the timer on the camera viewfinder, so I've been doing super long Q&As because I just can't see how long it is and I end up just talking forever. So, uh, And I'm still kind of on track to run a long one today, but uh, anyway, if I keep glancing over there, that's why. Uh, anyway, personal questions, here we go. Uh, I got a question from Sweet Nightingale 2907 on YouTube. With so much variety of ink to choose from, there are just as many reasons to select an ink 
to use at a particular time. Do you personally use different colors for different reasons? For example, play picking an ink that reflects the mood you're in. What is your selection process for choosing the ink you want to write with at a given time? Well, uh, for me, now this is purely just a personal thing. I mean, it's different if it's like a new ink, like Blue Ocean comes in with the gold fleck, like it did a couple weeks ago, and it's, it's new, it's hot, it's like, yeah, I'm gonna go ink that thing up, I don't wanna try it out, and we're gonna see how awesome it is. Obviously, that's pretty easy. That's like, that decision's already made for me. Um, you know, or if it's something, something like, you know, we're doing a Monday matchup, and we've already chosen the ink, that's easy, but, which I've never done a Monday matchup, by the way. And I don't know that I ever will because our team is pretty rocking it pretty hard and I, I know that it would be kind of disappointing if I did one. Anyway, um, so uh, for, for um, choosing an ink personally, you know, just like literally if it's not like for work purposes, like I'm reviewing an ink or something like that, if it's just like, hey, I need, I have a pen, it needs ink, what do I do? Uh, for me, it's I'm, I'm very impulsive about that kind of decision. Um, a lot of times it has to do with what do I already have inked up in my pens? You know, what nib do I have? What kind of pen am I using? I'll, I'll take that into account. You know, I've got a pretty good idea of the properties of just about all the inks we have. Um, so if I have a pen, say for example, it's a flex pen, right? If I have a flex pen, I'm obviously going to choose something that I know shades really well. Um, I have a bottle of Apache Sunset. Pfft, that's almost my go-to. I've got Black Swan Australian Roses, some of that. So some of the things I have like full bottles of, I might go to those, uh, you know, you know, first just to kind of see what I've got going on. If it's just, you know, purely, I just need to get ink and a pen quickly, I'll do that as opposed to like going and hunting around for samples and whatnot. Um, but if it's, uh, if it's, you know, something where I just kind of want to wander about a bit, I might do a little more thought into it and just kind of think like, okay, what kind of color do I not have in any of my pens? You know, what do I, am I just really curious about? You know, some brands like Diatrementis are really, there's a lot of different color choices and I haven't spent as much time personally using those inks in my pens um, as maybe some of the other ones. So I might, you know, be inclined to be like, you know what, I've kind of, I've kind of neglected Diatrementis for a while. Let me, let me check a look, take a look at what they've got and, and ink something up. But, uh, Really, it just, it, there's a million different factors that could go on. So my thought process is really pretty personal. Um, just imagine, you know, <laughs> you're gonna hate me, but just imagine if you had 600 inks at your disposal, what would your thought process be for inking it up? You know, I, I pretty much have every ink at, at, at the ready that I could use, not necessarily in bottle form, because I don't actually don't have as many bottles as you might think. Uh, a lot of the bottles that I have are ones that like leak in transit, and so I end up with like, you know, bottles with ink all over them because it's like, all right, what are we going to do? If we, we could sample them up, you know, if it's just a ruined label or whatever, you know, because what happens sometimes is we'll get shipments that'll break, especially in the wintertime, it'll freeze, break, whatever. Um, and that bottle's wasted, but it'll get ink all over a bunch of other bottles. So we might bottom shelf them, we might use them for samples, really just depends the situation. So a lot of times I'll like rifle through some of our um, inks that, you know, I know are, are kind of gross looking and I'll just go through and be like, ooh, you know what? I like that color. I, I think I would like a full bottle of that. Yes, I will take a bottle of Red Dragon. Thank you very much. Um, and I'll kind of pull that out of there. But then it's like, you know, um, I'll have uh, just a random kind of hodgepodge of, of bottles in that way. Um, or it'll be things like, you know, Lamy Copper Orange or, you know, Blue Ocean or something like that where it's like, you know, new hotness kind of thing. And it's like, oop, yep, definitely taking a bottle of that. Uh, but anyway, um, so most of the other time it's samples though. So I have to kind of think through it a little bit and we have inventory that we have to adjust because we inventory every sample we have. Uh, we didn't used to do that, but we moved towards that as we've gotten busier. So now we inventory every single sample. Um, so now I can't just like, I can't just do like in the old days where we used to not have them inventoried. So I could literally just go up and be like, hmm, what do I want? Boop, I'll take that. I'll take this and this and this and this. And I can just go back and grab them. That was a lot easier. Now, it's, it's not quite as easy because I have to actually take them out of stock so that we don't accidentally sell something that I've just taken off the shelf. Um, so I have to um, go through and very intentionally through the back end of our store, like take it out of stock and then account for it and all that kind of stuff. So it's, hey, it's a little more involved than it used to be, but uh, you know, still worth it sometimes. So now what I'll do sometimes is I'll sit and think about like, all right, what are some 10 inks that I really wanna try? I'll sit down and do them all. And then I'll go back and pull them off the shelf and then try them out and kind of have them around. But my office is such a mess right now. I don't have like a good home for samples. Um, everything's in bins. Like you're, where the camera is right now, 
just several bookshelves filled with junk, um, not junk, but you know, filled with filled with um, disorganized uh, products uh, that I really need to spend time and go through, like I have the time right now. You know, you know, I've been talking about how much I've been gone, but anyway. Next question I've got is from Rob B on Facebook. Occasionally, I'm told when filling out some form or other that I can't use my pen. My practice usually is to suddenly become hard of hearing and ignore that. Love that, Rob. Uh, I, use, I use either blue or black inks in my daily writers, and the inks I've chosen dry pretty quickly. Are there any legitimate reasons for not using a fountain pen? And have you gotten any better response to these alleged rules than eye rolling and a muttered whatever? <laughs> um, you know, Rob, haters gonna hate. If they hate on your pen and they don't have a good reason for you not using your own pen, Whatever, man, just own up to it. Say like, look, this is my pen, I'm gonna use it, just deal with it. Um, personally, I haven't actually been in that situation before. You know, I've been using fountain pens now for about six years, and I've, I've honestly never been in a situation where I've been like in public or anywhere, I mean, especially around my office, you know, obviously where I am here is not your typical office situation. It's like around here, if you're not using a fountain pen, that's when you get the weird looks. Um, but, uh, you know, it's pretty much only in public and honestly I've got two young kids and stuff like that so I don't like go a lot of public places but usually be like business meetings and events and stuff like that um, but since I'm in the pen business it's almost like my business card is a fountain pen people are like oh what is that and I'm like oh well I'm in the pen business really oh yeah blah blah and it's like this really positive thing so I never get sass from people you know I almost kind of wish that I would sometimes because then I could like totally just you know you know step up and whatever but it never works out that way for me just because of the situation that I'm in you know they're like oh what is what, what kind of pen is that you know if I do get if I do get any kind of weird situation it's usually just like you know unfamiliarity you know it's not like people turning their turning up their noses or whatever but it'll just be like people that have never seen a fountain pen or like they don't know what to do with that and they'll be like what is that and be like oh it's a fountain pen and we're like what a fountain pen they still make those i'm like oh yeah well you know actually i have a store and so so on and they're like really a store oh my gosh how'd you get into that and then it's like well okay <laughs> you know because i i am not i am not uh short of word if you have noticed so um i almost kind of shy away from telling people my my story if i you know, in like at the checkout line at the grocery store or something, and it's like, all right, my kids are in the car. Like, I can't tell you my life story. I gotta go. You know, so I'd be like, oh yeah, it's a fountain pen. Oh yeah, okay, whatever. It's a big, you know, no, whatever. Okay, I'll use your ballpoint. You know, whatever. <coughs> it's that kind of situation. So me personally, I am not like. I mean, obviously, I love fountain pens. Clearly, I am like financially incentivized to try to advocate for them and tell everybody in the world about fountain pens. But that's actually not my approach. I don't consider myself to be a very good salesman, believe it or not, in the traditional sense. Like if I had to do door-to-door -door sales and cold calling and stuff like that for fountain pens, I would be out of that business very quickly. I'm, I'm really not good at that kind of thing. Uh, I'm much better at sharing my passion with other people, connecting people who share passion. That's what we've done here at Goulet and that works really well. I shoot a video, put it up there, share it with everybody who is interested in it. We connect, great, you engage, post a comment, I post back. Awesome, that's what I love. Trying to convince people that aren't interested in fountain pens that fountain pens are something they should be interested in, not my bag. It's just, you know, it's an uphill battle and I'm just not, it's, the ROI is not there. It's too involved, you know what I mean? That would be like somebody trying to convince me why I should buy $100 jeans, you know? I'm never gonna buy $100 jeans, ever. I don't see the point, personally. Other people do, that's great, more power to you. I'm not gonna do it. So you're, you can talk to me until you're blue in your face about $100 jeans and I'm not gonna buy them because it just not makes sense for me. Same kind of thing, except way more universally uh, with fountain pens. A lot of people just, it's way too much maintenance and too much to learn and I totally get that. You gotta be personally interested in it and passionate about it for it to really make sense for you. And then, oh man, then we can talk all day long. Um, but that's, that's the kind of situation. So for you and your situation, Rob, I would say, you know, it all depends on you personally. If you want to like go toe to toe with somebody and be like, look, this is my pen. This is part of who I am. Deal with it. I'm going to write it. It's not a big deal. And you just do it. Especially if you're writing a blue or black. Like what, what, what problem is somebody really going to have with that? You know what I mean? Unless it's more of a just a, they feel like you're being arrogant about it. But then you don't have to be arrogant about it. You can say, look, look, I really love fountain pens. Just look, it's writes really smooth. I just personally like to do it. It's more hygienic when I write with, you know, I've recently been sick. 
it's more hygienic when you are using your own personal pen instead of picking up a pen at the doctor's office and signing in when you know every sick person that's come in has picked up that ballpoint pen and written with it it makes a lot more sense for you to whip out your own pen and do it so there's a lot of like things a lot of practical things you could justify but honestly it boils down to i just really i love my pens and i just want to use them every chance i get how can they really argue with that you know what i mean so you don't have to be a jerk about it if somebody's being a jerk to you and you want to be a jerk back, that's really your call. Um, you know, honestly, you know, I talk, I talk fun, but if 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 the rubber hit the road and somebody actually like, you know, copped an attitude with me, I would totally back down and be like, look, okay, that's fine. You know, like I do not have, I do not have an abrasive personality as much as as much as I may talk smack to a camera. Uh, I would, I would never do it that to anybody in real life. Um, you know, I just, it's not, uh, it's not who I am. I would, I would just be like, all right, that's, that's cool. Just give me, you know, give me whatever pen you want me to use. Okay. I'll, I'll write with it and I'll go about my day. Um, it's not worth the fight for me. Uh, last question I've got for this week. This is from at Smada, Smada I probably butchered that, but, uh, on Twitter, Twitter handle, um, if you weren't doing what you do now, what career or job would you want to do instead? Ooh, yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Really good question. I definitely wanted to answer this one um, because I knew it would kind of like put me on the spot a little bit. So I was able to think about it a little bit. I'm not totally on the spot. You know, obviously I saw the question a few days ago. Um, if I wasn't doing, I like the way you phrased the question because it wasn't like if you weren't doing what you do now, you know, where, what you would you be doing? Because that makes it sound like if this business hadn't grown into something, what would I be doing? Which might not necessarily be what would I want to do instead, you know what I mean? Like I tried to start a pen making company, that is what I wanted to do, but that is not what I would be doing right now if I weren't doing what I, what I was doing, you know what I mean? So the way you phrase your question is, what would you want to do instead, okay? So assuming that I can't do what I'm doing right now anymore, I have to do something else, what do I want to do? Okay, so that's the context of the question that I'm answering here. Um, I honestly, I really love what I do. I really do. I think that comes across, obviously. Um, I'm really enjoying the phase of business that I'm in right now. It's very challenging, um, very difficult in a lot of ways because, you know, I get to sit down and talk about pens right now in a Q&A type setting and I really love it because I get to engage. I get to talk about the products that I love so much. But the reality is that's not most of how I spend my time anymore because I have a team of 30 people here and a lot of my time is spent trying to grow myself as a leader, as a business person. So I'm studying a lot, I'm reading a lot, I'm networking, talking with other business leaders, trying to be a step ahead, set the vision, communicate, spend time on clarity, a lot of things that would translate into running any effective business. Um, building relationships with key manufacturers and vendors, things like that, that usually involve products, but maybe involve things other than products in terms of relationships and logistics and things like that. Um, so there's a lot of that stuff going on, financial aspect of things. So being in the position I'm in, I'm really enjoying it because, you know, I couldn't learn more about business if I was studying it and getting a doctorate of it, you know. Um, I'm, I'm fully immersed in this. I'm learning more about people, communication, delegation, all that stuff. So I personally am just having kind of a blast getting to experience this level of business leadership and development uh, at this age that most people just don't get to experience. So that is just awesome. So I'm just eating that up. Uh, that's why I work as hard as I do is because I really enjoy that challenge of learning that much stuff uh, at the point that I'm at right now. Um, that said, if I wasn't in the situation that I'm in right now of having the Goulet Pen Company, um, I would still really enjoy being involved in kind of that business leadership aspect of things. Um, given the fact that I have somewhat of a personality, um, <laughs> I enjoy talking with people, I enjoy networking um, to a degree, not like from a go to a thousand person conference and hand out my business card to everybody in the room, but I really enjoy building relationships with like-minded business folks. So uh, I think I would really enjoy being kind of the business leadership realm. You know, I think about people like the Dave Ramseys and the Gary Vaynerchuks and the Seth Godins and all that kind of stuff, John Maxwell and people that do like public speaking and consulting and stuff like that. 
that's something I have considered for like way down the road once I really have earned my stripes and got a lot of experience, would I consider doing some public speaking and that kind of stuff? Um, I'd, I'd certainly be open to it, especially if I get to the point, right now I still feel like I'm at the point where I'm learning so much. I don't really have as much to share because I'm, I'm still in the thick of it. If I can see my way through the, some of the rapid growth and stuff like that and, and get a really solid, stable, I mean, we've got a fantastic company here. There's no question about that. However, we've grown very aggressively. Once we get to that point of where the, the business is naturally kind of stabilizing and things are just running smoothly and we're in good shape, I could you know, either start another business, or I could just stay here and just keep running a great company and you know spend more time with my kids and have an actual hobby or a social life eventually um, that would be an option <coughs> or the other option would be to you know kind of pay it forward a little bit and get into kind of the you know sharing my experiences in some capacity whether it's writing a book or public speaking or something like that that is certainly not outside the realm of possibilities for me i could totally see doing that someday i'm only 30 got a lot of years ahead of me if I'm able to navigate some of the more, the bigger challenges that my company is going through um, now and for the next many years, um, I feel like I would have some experience that's worth sharing in some capacity. Um, I think that I've been blessed and I've been put in a position that not a lot of people have this opportunity to run a business like this. Um, and I'm trying to make the most of it every single day. And uh, I would love to be able to share that experience someday with people in some capacity, um, if people are willing to listen. Um, just like I sit down and started a Q&A video a year and a half ago and said, I've got some experience with fountain pens. I'll just turn on a camera and talk about it. And if people like it, they'll watch. And you're still watching. So thank you for that, first of all. But um, if, if it ends up being in a situation where I've amassed enough business knowledge, um, where I can share some of that and have a similar kind of experience where people want to sit and watch me talk about business, uh, I would do that as well. I think it would be a lot of fun. Um, so I enjoy that very much. So I don't know exactly what that would look like, but something along those lines, podcasting, blogging, um, whatever it is, writing articles, books, that kind of stuff. I could see doing something like that, but it's tough. Doing that stuff in, in the realm of business um, is harder because you either need to have an academic background or you need to um, you know, have experience running a business to write a business type book. Otherwise, you're just writing fiction because if you... <laughs> If you haven't really been through it yet, and, and personally, the people that have studied a lot of business, I don't really find those books to be quite as interesting, personally, because um, there's so much about running a business that you just can't study. You just gotta go through it. It's like having kids, you know I mean? There's so many parallels between, uh, and literally, I know, because I've had two children as I've started this business. Um, so there's so many parallels between parenting and running a business. The sleepless nights, the stress, the not knowing if you're doing anything right, you know, <laughs> that kind of stuff. Um, there's um, there's uh, a, you know, a lot of parallels there. So um, I, I personally find much more credit from people that have actually been through it themselves. That's why I gravitate towards a lot of the people's names whose bookshelves or books you see on the bookshelf. Is a lot, you'll find a lot of them are people that have actually been, been through and started their own business. Um, so um, if we really want to kind of get away further from the question that you asked and, and say something more along the lines of like, you know, if I wasn't doing what I was doing now, what would I want to do and, and like take pr kind of practicality out the window um, and like money doesn't matter, that kind of thing. Um, you know, obviously money is not what motivates me uh, to, the, to the complete end goal, but I, I do have a family to provide for and stuff like that. So that certainly weighs in. Um, to, to things, even in a fantasy type situation. But if that, if that factor were removed, um, I would love to do something with my hands. I love woodworking. I'm a very physical person. Um, so being able to do something with woodworking, I would really enjoy that very much. Uh, master craftsman of some kind. I loved wood turning. I really enjoyed that when I was pen making. Um, that's originally why I got into pen making is was purely driven by my passion was never able to make it work financially um, to be able to continue it on, but I still love it. Um, I haven't been able to do it for five years because I've put everything on hold for my kids and my business, uh, but it's still something that I enjoy and still something in the back of my mind. I'm like, yep, you know what? This passion is something that's on ice right now, but I could see bringing this back in five or 10 years, especially as my son, he's five now, as he gets to be around eight or 10, I could see getting back into the woodworking thing purely so that I can teach that to him, share that with him, 
Um, I've also got a very musical background, so teaching my kids musical instruments as well. Rachel and I have been dabbling a little bit with that. Uh, both our kids have a pretty good key, so they can sing pretty well, and uh, I think they may have picked up on the musical gene a little bit. Neither of my parents were musical. I learned it all through, through school and experience. Um, so that is something that would be neat to raise our kids in kind of a musical household. I don't know what that would mean in terms of career. I definitely don't want to be a musician as a career. Um, but just being able to do that a little bit more. Um, so yeah, probably if it wasn't a, a practical thing, I would say woodworking in some capacity would be it. Well, that's it for this week. Uh, another long kind of extended Q&A. Hope you've enjoyed this one uh, to satisfy you uh, while I've uh, been taking a bit of a sabbatical on some of the other content. Um, but uh, I got a question of the week for you this week, and a kind of a good one, I think, related to Rob's question from earlier. Um, has anyone ever given you any sass for using a fountain pen? Whether it's a stranger just giving you a weird look, or a friend or a family member who just rolls their eyes every time that you pull out a pen or talk about your latest pen. I'm just curious to know, what's like the most extreme situation that you've ever run into being a person that uses a fountain pen in your daily life. Uh, share with that in the comments on YouTube or on the blog. I'd be very curious to hear what that's like, to read, read some of your comments. I always love the questions of the week. Um, get a lot of good stuff there, and it's always really, really engaging. So I appreciate when you post that kind of stuff. Um, that's all for this week. I'll be back again next week um, with some more great stuff. So be sure to ask any questions in the comments on YouTube or on the blog. Um, you can also hit us up on Twitter, on Facebook, uh, and that would be great. Uh, and then we can have more questions so I can sit here and talk some more about pens. So I um, hope you have a great weekend, great rest of your week. Be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't already. YouTube subscribership continues to grow and I very much enjoy that and appreciate. And the more engagement I see from you, the more motivated I am to take time uh, to shoot more stuff for you. So I'm can try and always trying to step up my game uh, in that way. So hope you enjoyed this one and right on.